This is Duke University. Good morning or good afternoon, whichever noon it is. Um, my name is Duncan Merle. I'm the writer in residence at the Center for Documentary Studies uh, and also one of the hosts of ULABIS who has been here on a two-day visit uh, to Duke. Um, this, this semester, or this fall, in support of her book on immunity. Um, and we had a reading last night, and uh, we've had some talks, or some opportunities for her to interact with students and with staff, and now we're here um, to have some interaction with faculty and scholars, uh, get a forum for scholars and public. So this is a uh, part of a uh, ongoing reading series, or visiting writer series that we've developed with the Keenan Institute for Ethics, and Michaela Dwyer has been my colleague in planning this, um, with the Keenan Institute for Ethics to bring, to bring um, young or unheard or otherwise sort of overlooked um, uh, writers. That's not a really nice way to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> what, I mean, what I mean is, what I mean is, what I mean is, is like, to bring, to bring authors who you might not have otherwise read to this campus and you know get them really plugged into the intellectual life of our university and uh, I think we're succeeding at that so next semester uh, we're going to have Leslie Jameson here just so that you know uh, who's the author of the empathy exams um, but anyway that's what we're doing with the with the reading series so this is the culminating event of uh, Eula's visit here today, and it's sort of sad. Yeah, it is. I, was just sad. I would like to thank. Uh, you have to, I have to do this, um, but I'm also grateful to uh, our sponsors who have helped us. We've had uh, an amazing amount of campus-wide support for this um, uh, visiting writers series that we're developing. So I would like to thank the Forum for Scholars and Publics, Arts and Health at Duke, the Thompson Writing Program the Office of the Vice Provost for the Arts, the Department of English, Women's Studies, the Franklin Humanities Institute, the DeWitt Wallace Center for Media and Democracy, and the Baldwin Scholars. So thank you all for uh, your support. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, our panelists today. And I'm going to start with uh, Saiba Varma, who is sitting to my right. Um, she received her PhD in anthropology from Cornell in 2013. Her research focuses on mental health and trauma-based medical humanitarian interventions in Kashmir, a disputed region currently occupied by India. Since 2012, she has worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the Thompson Writing Program here at Duke. Her courses focus on issues related to violence and social suffering, humanitarianism and medicine, culture and healing, and her work has been featured in Cultural Anthropology, Ethos, Economic and Political Weekly, and online on the blogs Somatosphere and War Skills. Welcome, Sai. <laughs> um, Barry Saunders on the end there. Uh, for 20 years until December 2011, uh, Barry was an emergency physician at Chatham Hospital in Silo City, North Carolina, which is near where I live, so thank you for doing that. Um, <laughs> In that time, he was also a cultural anthropologist of contemporary biomedicine and teaching hospitals, using approaches from philosophy, anthropology, history, religious studies, and literary criticism to consider how medicine and hospitals are, among other things, religious institutions with their own doctrines and scriptures, rituals, and priesthoods. In his academic writing, he is inter interested in how textual, rhetorical, and imaging techniques condition what seems evident. His first book, CT Suite, The Work of Diagnosis in the Age of Non-Invasive Cutting, Duke University Press, 2008, is an ethnography and philosophical history of CT, that is, computed tomography scanning. So, thank you. Welcome, Barry. And finally, I'd like to introduce our author, Eula Biss. She is the author of three books on immunity and inoculation, which was recently named one of the best books of 2014 by Publishers Weekly. She's also the author of no Notes from No Man's Land, American Essays, and The Balloonists, which was a collection of poetry. Her work has been supported by a Guggenheim Fellowship, 
a Howard Foundation Fellowship, an NEA Literature Fellowship, and a Jaffe Writers Award. In 2009, she won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Notes from No Man's Land. She holds a BA in nonfiction writing from Hampshire College and an MFA in nonfiction writing from the University of Iowa. Her essays have recently appeared in the Best American Non-Required Reading, which <laughs> and the Touchstone Anthology of Contemporary Nonfiction, as well as in The Believer, Gulf Coast, Denver Quarterly, Third Coast, and Harper's Magazine. Eula Biss and John Breslin are the Chicago-based band Stet Everything, which is my favorite band name of all time. Does anyone know what Stet means? It's like an old copy it's like editor's, an editor's term. mark to keep it as yeah. it Stet, is. Stet means like keep it as it is. So <laughs> it, it's something that writers write on their manuscripts after editors have done their damage. <laughs> so you write Stet. So thank you for naming your band that. That was my little joke to other writers. We don't actually have a band. Um, oh, is that right? We <laughs> are just two very stubborn people who hate for our work to be edited. And if at some point, I, um, I put a manuscript down on the table and I said, I just want to say, stud everything. And, um, and then my husband said, we should start a band called stud everything. <laughs> And so now we, we actually both put that in our bios. But the band is conceptual. Our music is conceptual. <laughs> it's the music of stubborn people acting out their stubbornness. Well, <laughs> um, oh, I like it. So, so I would like to start by asking you a question, Yula. Yeah. And then this is the way it will work. Um, Yula's going to speak for a little bit. And then I'm going to ask both Saiba and um, um, Barry to respond in their own way to their to their work, to the work that they read, and also to the ideas that were presented uh, in the book. So what I would like to ask you, you will, I may, um, would you describe the genesis of this project that became On Immunity, uh, how you knew it was the subject for a book, and how your conception of that subject changed from the beginning of your work, at the very beginning, to the end, when you find out. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. So this book came out of what, what began as a very personal investigation for me. I was pregnant with my son, and, um, and I, had, I had not thought very much about vaccination at all. It's, I was vaccinated, and, um, and I had heard some vague rumors from other parents around me that there might be reasons for me to be concerned about vaccinating my son, but I didn't even really understand what the concerns were. So it was, to, to me, it was all quite vague and just a kind of anxiety that was in the air. And so um, I thought, because I do a lot of research for my writing, I thought, oh, I'll clear this all up with, with an evening of research. And, um, and I didn't think it would be that hard. And so I sat down and, and started reading and uh, almost immediately I had a sensation that this was much bigger than I understood it was and that it was not going to be cleared up with a few evenings of reading. Um, and eventually, it, it, it did only take me maybe a few months to get to the point where I, my most basic questions had been answered and I was comfortable vaccinating my son. But even after um, I had vaccinated him and made the decision to follow the childhood schedule, um, I found that the, the reading I'd already done had brought up a lot of questions that were still interesting to me and I still wanted to pursue and, um, and had opened this terrain that I didn't initially anticipate I would find myself in when I started looking into vaccination. So I found myself um, I, I, thinking about the, the individual's relationship to the government and the individual's relationship to society at large and citizenship, and, but also environmental issues and issues of toxicity in our environment. And, um, and then, and, and really metaphor emerged. This book is as much about metaphor as it is about vaccination. And um, fairly early on, I started noticing the, the density of metaphor around vaccination. And it, I noticed it in conversations with other parents. And um, once I started um, doing some intensive research and, and working with an immunologist, I noticed it in the language that the immunologist was using. 
Um, and one of the first things that piqued my interest was that the immunologist's metaphors were different than the metaphors being used by the other mothers I knew. They were two really distinct sets of metaphors. Um, and so, you know, the, the genesis was quite messy and meandering, really. I, I, I read in lots of different directions simultaneously. So I read some anthropology and I read a history of um, the anti-vaccine movement in Victorian England. I read um, in, in immunology and I talked to immunologists and I took a class in immunology. Um, and I, throughout this, I had a lot of conversations with other parents and other mothers and um, continued to try to investigate both their fears and, and fears that I myself had found myself vulnerable to. And that, that's what was interesting to me and continued to be interesting is why was I vulnerable to these fears and, and what had made those fears seductive to me? And was it something about this actual technology or was it something about our time or was it something about the gender politics involved or um, the the governmental politics involved and so that's really how this book not just came to be and 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 continued to be but also how it got its shape so it's it's written in 30 short sections and um and part of where that shape came from is that i found that there were just many facets to this issue and I wanted to touch as many of those as I could. So that's part of where that that um, shape of 30 short segments came from. I think any one of those 30 pieces could have been expanded into its own long essay. Um, but I was really interested in the relationships between these things. Um, so I had to sometimes sacrifice depth in, in any particular area of the book in order to look at the relationships between all these these parts. Um, I think that answers. Oh, and you asked when did I discover it was a book and um, what did your thinking change over the course? Oh, of, yeah, that was the mm -hmm. part. Of, yeah, uh, doing this. Yeah, my thinking changed a lot, and um, and I haven't yet found the best way of articulating this this shift that I made as both a thinker and a person who acts. Um, but I think I became less extreme in both action and thought, um, but in a way that seems contradictory. So where I was when I first started writing is um, I was vaccine hesitant in that I didn't vaccinate my son um, against Hep B, which is the first vaccination on the schedule. Um, but at the same time that I had that hesitation and acted on it, I also held the belief that people who didn't vaccinate were um, were ignorant and um, and that that was the main problem, which seems contradictory. But I inhabited both things, so somehow it's it's possible. And what I found is that I moved on on both in in both places. I moved, but in what would seem to be opposite directions. So in action, um, I came to a place where I was doing something very different. I was following the childhood schedule. Um, exactly as it's written out. Um, and in thought, I became much more um, empathic to the, the position of, of not wanting to vaccinate and got a much fuller understanding, I think, though it's still incomplete, but a much fuller understanding of the many reasons that people resist vaccinations and, um, and a, a much deeper respect for that position. Um, so I guess I got moderated in every way by the work. <laughs> you said something that I'd like to follow up on before I go to you. Um, but you mentioned uh, well the metaphorical, the metaphors that you ran across, and mm -hmm. that there was a distinction between the metaphors sort of orbiting around vaccination mm -hmm. in the world of the immunologist mm -hmm. and in the world of the person being vaccinated or the person yeah. making these decisions mm -hmm. um, for themselves. Does that have does that have real world <coughs> impact or is this just a uh, you know a happens to be a difference in the language that they use? Yeah, I think it has real world impact. Um, like 
An example of this, and this is just one of many examples, but many lay people tend to have concerns about quantity with vaccination. And, um, and sometimes that becomes meta a metaphor for just concerns about, I think, American excess in general. And so <laughs> there's this concern, we're, we're giving this child too much too soon. And I think that that resonates for us as Americans because children get, get too much too soon of a lot of things in this culture. You know, too much sugar, too much TV, too much a lot of things that they probably shouldn't get that early. Um, and, but, but many, many of the parents I talked to, even parents who were following the schedule, said, I, I just have this sense that this is too much, that we're doing too much. Um, and this, this sense of excess is, was really absent when I talked to immunologists. So um, many of them um, felt that there are important areas where we don't have vaccines. So they, they would focus on kind of the lack, like we don't have a vaccine against malaria. And many of the, the practitioners that I talked to really felt an absence there, you know, of, that we, we could use a vaccine we don't have. But they, they also didn't, they fundamentally didn't see several vaccinations at the same time as something excessive for the body, in part because um, at least the immunology professor that I worked with most closely, he was very aware of what the body is doing all the time in terms of handling pathogens. And, um, and once I understood how he was thinking about that, I understood that, yeah, vaccination doesn't seem excessive when you balance it against um, all the... Um, all the conversation our body is having with pathogens constantly. So the instant an infant even enters the birth canal, they're suddenly coated in bacteria, and bacteria is all over their body, inside their back body. Um, they're being colonized. And every you know, minute of every day for an infant is, uh, is just thousands of encounters with pathogens. And the body is, is constantly working with and against pathogens. And um, and so in comparison, like three vaccines at once just doesn't seem like a, it, it's like a drop in a bucket to an immunologist. So I did, I really didn't hear them using any, any language of excess around vaccination. Um, in, in what I did hear was a, a kind of odd reverence for the the incredible microbial world that we're kind of constantly in conversation in our own, you know, what people sometimes call like microbiome, right? And, and again and again, immunologists were telling me, um, we're more them than us. <laughs> like there's more cells of other creatures inside us than there are cells that are human cells. <laughs> and, um, and, one immunologist even said if an alien looked at us from outer space, they would just think we were transportation for microbes. Like, it's, that's kind of what we, our purpose appears to be, getting them from one place to another. Um, so that's, and, and you can see how that bears out on vaccination, right? Where, where one set of people is thinking this is way too much, and the other set of people is thinking this is, oh, this is just a tiniest little drop in the bucket in terms of what your immune system is doing. Thank you. Saiba, I'd like to turn it to you, and you know, I'd like to hear your response to this book or what uh, Yua has just said. Uh, in light of your own research and your own writing. Sure. Um, well, thank you. you know, I really enjoyed the book, and um, I didn't really know very much about vaccination, so this was a really great opportunity for me to learn, um, so thank you for that. Um, so I, I thought that the book um, did a really beautiful job of sort of tracing um, this, this quest for immunity and looking at it as a sort of ethical project, a social project, a political project. Um, and I thought you did a really nice job of kind of balancing, um, dis you know, looking at both sides of this problem of the desire not to vaccinate or the desire to vaccinate. Um, and I think that brings, you know, brings up these really kind of 
important, pressing sort of social and political questions that I feel like we are all wrestling with on, on some level. So um, on the one hand, um, I thought that the decision to vaccinate, you show how that's, um, it's, it's both a kind of acknowledgement of group ethics, right? The sense that we all inhabit a social body and we all kind of share, we, we all have a shared responsibility to that social body um, and that we are kind of all inter, interdependent. Um, the philosopher of science, Anne-Marie Moll, would kind of talk about that as the excorporation of the body or she calls them leaky bodies, um, which I think is very similar to what you're talking about. Um, but I think at the same time, you also wrestle with the question of how this desire to immune, you know, to immunize is also a way of kind of sealing off the body. Um, and I think this came up a little bit in the Q and A last yeah. evening. Like, um, it's it's almost the sense of other people as being diseased or other parts of the world as being the problem, and we need to kind of seal ourselves yeah. off from that. Um, but then on the other on the other side of it, I think you also show how decisions not to vaccinate, how while they might put the social body at risk um, in some ways, that um, they also emerge from, I felt like real fears and anxieties about contamination and about um, late capitalism, about you know industrialization and things like that. Um, and this, I think, very real problem of of medicine and capital just being so interwoven that any advances in medical technology are, you know, driven by some kind of economic calculus rather than actually making our health better. So I felt like the people against vaccination are mm -hmm. touching on those really important mm -hmm. issues which are, you know, they're not easy to discuss. Um, so I think you, you do a really beautiful job of balancing these things and, um, through a very personal, you know, story, and I thought that um, what I really appreciated was that you took a stand in the end, um, that you didn't just kind of stay neutral in this, but you, um, I think, you know, made a really great intervention into this um, debate. So I had a couple of questions that came up for me, and yeah. um, you don't have to answer all of them, but they might, I don't know, other people also had these questions, but. Um, one thing that struck me was that the book is is very much about the contemporary U.S. Mm -hmm. and in a sense it sort of upholds this idea of a bounded kind of nation state, mm -hmm. um, you know. Um, but it made me think about the other kinds of publics that are implicated in this vaccination mm -hmm. thing. So the fact that vaccine trials, for example, take place in mm -hmm other countries where there are so-called treatment naive populations um, so that other bodies are actually being called on to um, protect the public health of people in the developed world. Yeah. Um, that's something that mm -hmm. um, stuck out at me when we're thinking about the social body, like who are, who's excluded and who's included mm -hmm. in that social body. Um, another thing um, that I found really interesting was just to kind of compare, um, so I work in India in uh, hospitals and one of the things that was very interesting was that in India um, vaccinations are actually highly desired and desirable. So people have very positive associations with injections. Mm -hmm. They're often like the first um, encounter that people have with biomedicine and um, I think there's something about the form of the injection which is associated with like potency and efficacy mm -hmm. and the kind of positive things mm -hmm. of biomedicine. Yeah. Um, whereas by contrast, pharmaceuticals are mm -hmm. the source of a lot of anxiety and fear, similar to what you describe here yeah. around vaccination. So I was wondering about this relationship between vaccinations and pharmaceuticals and mm -hmm. how, why is it that there, there's in the U.S. There seem to be all of these fears. Um, you know, why do they coalesce around vaccinations, for example, and why don't we worry in the same way about taking yeah. pills and what pills are doing yeah. to our bodies? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a really interesting question. Um, should I go on? I don't know. How should we? No, I think you should answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, and I wish I knew, I think there's another book to be written, probably by someone who's not me, but that would really look at the international landscape and the international politics and the international thinking, too. Um, but I, I did find myself wondering, as I learned more about vaccination, why the anxiety was fo focusing there, when in many ways, um, vaccines don't act on our bodies the way most pharmaceuticals do, the way chemical drugs do. And, and it, in, in many ways, they're engaging your own system. And, and to me, when I learned more about what vaccines do to the body, it looked to me much more like what I think of as holistic medicine than um, like taking um, aspirin or something. Um, which I guess also has its roots in holistic medicine, right? It came from wintergreen, but I, you know, it, but but to me, taking a chemical to have an effect on your body, it's, it seemed fundamentally different than having a, a a small disarmed pathogen put inside you so that your own immune system could provide you with the things to to prevent disease. That that does seem different, and so yeah. So why do the fears focus there? And I wonder if it's you know, it's interesting that in Pakistan, which is not far yeah. from India, there actually is a lot of anxiety around vaccination and a lot yeah. of rejection of the polio vaccine. And, um, and that's a vaccine that in that area is given orally, so it's not a needle. You know, so I, I think that a lot of this is about the, the conceptual stuff. It's not about the actual technology itself or the mode of entry, even though I do think the needle is a powerful visual for some people. Um, but the thing that seems to be similar in Pakistan and in this country is the the fear of um, of violation and penetration. And in, in Pakistan, that had a lot to do with actually that what happened with our CIA and um, this uh, fake vaccination campaign that was, um, that was used to try to locate Osama bin Laden. And, um, and this fake vaccination campaign used real needles and real Hep B vaccine, but not the three doses that you need to become immune to Hep B. And, um, and when it came out that this had happened, um, s a lot of people started saying vaccination is a form of espionage. And it's kind of hard to argue with that when the CIA has actually used vaccination <laughs> as a form of espionage. But I think that what made that really stick was the sense, and I think this comes up with vaccination a lot, that the sense that it's an intrusion, it's an invasion into the body. And, and you know, we have this metaphor of the, the nation as a body. So when, when the nation is penetrated by an outside force like the CIA, CIA and it does something really invasive, like use a fake vaccine campaign, um, it's easy for vaccination to become a metaphor for that larger, um, that larger violation, right? The violation of the state is is mirrored in the violation of the body, and and I think that people have that anxiety. There's a lot of anxiety in this culture around government intrusion, and in, you know, into our private space, into our private homes, into our private lives. And vaccination, I think, has absorbed some of that and become a symbol of intrusion of the government into our our actual physical space, into our bodies and made even here more powerful by the fact that it's often with a needle, right? And, and so that needle becomes emblematic of that outside force coming into your space. I don't know if that's a yeah, no. sufficient answer. <laughs> Saiba, I had a question for you. I noticed that you, um, when, when Eula was talking earlier, that you were nodding your head when she was um, discussing, uh, you know, empathy for the fearful, essentially. You know, the ones who fear, um, this this uh, invasion, as you've just called it, have you run across that in your work, for instance, in Kashmir? I'm interested in in a in a contested um, geographical space whether that you know fear of fear of medical intervention is also prevalent. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and do they connect? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think people there, as I was saying, the fear is really around pharmaceuticals and pills because there's such a um, proliferation of 
India has a very particular landscape of pharmaceutical companies where there are thousands of manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And so there's generics, counterfeit drugs, and branded drugs mm -hmm. all kind of circulating. And I think mm -hmm. that adds to the anxiety of you don't really know what you're getting. Um, so if you're, you know, people would say, they would go to the doctor and say things like, I don't know if the doctor is giving me a poison mm -hmm. or it, is he actually giving me a drug? And that kind of ties into the larger sort of breakdown of social trust and relationships. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that this has been a con, a, you know, an area of conflict for the last 20 years. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's so much interpersonal kind of mistrust that I think that gets transposed onto mm -hmm. things like medicine and, and drugs. So, yeah. 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 Um, I guess another question I had, which was related to your earlier um, thing, which were, you were talking about this, you know, on the one hand, the immunologists don't see any idea of excess for them. This is like a drop in the bucket, as yeah. you said, but versus what for the mothers, this is seems really excessive. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, how do you kind of square that or think yeah. about that mm -hmm. in terms of, I know in the book you talk about the fact that this is a kind of expanding mm -hmm. regime, right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I think you said that you had 14 vaccinations. Mm -hmm. Your son, I think, the mm -hmm. 20 something. Mm -hmm. or, well, he, he was vaccinated against 14 diseases. Yeah, and I think I was seven, and my father was two or five. I can't remember it now. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like there is something mm -hmm. going on here that's potentially disturbing in terms of the way these things are getting medicalized or the way that they're becoming a part of mm -hmm. you know what it means to be healthy or what it means to be a yeah. citizen um, so yeah. I was wondering if you could kind of talk about that a little bit yeah I mean that, that was for me when I started working on this that was the most compelling um, anxiety the one that was most successful seductive to me was this sense of excess mm -hmm. too much and um, and even after I, I determined that my son would be vaccinated I still felt uncomfortable with the number of vaccinations though that sh really shifted it, it, towards the end of the book I stopped feeling that way and maybe because um, I spent time researching a number of diseases that we don't have vaccinations against like malaria and really looking at you, what has to be done in places that are um, riddled with malaria and how imperfect those solutions seem compared to vaccination and um, the amount of medical intervention in people's lives is massive compared to a vaccination and so when I started weighing these things even with a disease like chickenpox you know like everyone uh, of basically of my generation had it and um, and that was a disease that I thought I'm, I'm comfortable with my son having this let's let's and I had a conversation with the pediatrician where I said how about not this one but then she she talked to me about it and, and gave me her reasoning and and it actually it, it came to seem sensible to me um, in that you know in the US yeah not a lot of people are gonna die from chickenpox but before we vaccinated it was about 10,000 you know and um, and 70,000 children were, were hospitalized every year. And she said, you know, that some of those children had underlying medical conditions, some didn't. And it's, you know, it's not, we can't necessarily predict who's gonna end up in the hospital. And when you look at the, I think, the, the degree of disruption and, and medicalization that would happen for those 70,000 children who end up in the hospital with, you know, pneumonia as a complication of chickenpox compared to vaccinating every child in the country, it actually again seems like the the less medically, you know, invasive approach is the preventative medicine approach rather than the let's wait for this thing to happen and then deal with it in inside this imperfect system, you know, where um, if I had to watch my son be like intubated and put on a heart-lung machine and like all these things as a result of serious complications of chickenpox, I think I would start thinking, oh, you know, a, a vaccination would be far less medically invasive. And, and that was actually 
And part of this came from talking to an immunologist, Paul Lafitte, who is one of the few living people who has invented a vaccine. He invented the rotavirus vaccine. And he's also a pediatrician and a, a, a practicing, he practices in a teaching hospital. And I was interested when I talked to him about, um, he was very emotional on this subject. And, um, and part of it came from him seeing children every day getting massive um, medical interventions um, for things that are preventable. So it, mostly he was talking to me about influenza and seeing young children with incredibly serious cases of influenza. And, um, and actually I ended up talking to him just a week after he'd seen a, a young patient die. And then he had to you know, go and talk to the parents and I'm like tearing up because it's so horrible. Um, but it was very upsetting for him too. And, and from his point of view, he said that's a preventable death. In, especially in this country. We all have access to the food vaccine. And this child who died had been vaccinated against everything else. Um, so, I mean, I, I actually, I hear, like, I hear that concern and I, and, and I think it's real in some ways, but I also feel like, um, you know, if the goal is to preserve human life, right, and, um, and there's two kind of methodologies that we could use. We could use this preventative medicine approach, or we could wait for those 10,000 kids to have the problem they're going to have. It, it does seem kind of prudent and sensible to take the preventative approach um, and not super overcautious or, or excessive. Though there's countries that can't afford it, right? It's, you know, I think you do have to choose. We, I also asked Paul Offit, he sat on the, the committee that decides what we put on the childhood schedule, and I asked him, you know, why do we vaccinate against more diseases than any other country? And he said, because we choose to afford to. And, um, and I think that that's the truth. Like, we, we choose to afford this preventative medicine where other countries make other choices that I think also reflect value systems that are legitimate, so. Thank you. Yeah. Barry, I would like to turn it to you and get your thoughts on this, on anything that has been said so far in relation to your own work. Yeah, your own research. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, off, off the bat though, how many of you have had a chance to read this wonderful book, or are you, so, some, but so not all. So this is this is your introduction to the book. Okay, that helps. Um, well, it's a beautifully written book um, and uh, beautifully crafted. I mean, not just in terms of the sentences and the rhythms, but um, this segmentation of what, in a lot of, for many of the segments, feel like standalone segments, right? Mm -hmm. They, um, they're um, meditations. I found myself asking. Uh, um, why the subtitle? Why inoculation? I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. But there's one place where Eula um, talks about how many immunogenic agents there are, elements there are in smallpox vaccine. It took like 200, and I was thinking, okay, we have 30 segments, and maybe six or seven, you know, kind of um, elemental things that she puts in play in each of these segments in very provocative and interesting ways. And um, so I, I think it sort of scaled a little bit like an inoculation. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that may not be what you meant. I'd love to know. No, no, I, I love that reading. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of my life is, um, or a lot of the reading that I do is, is um, dictated by what I can get medical students to read. I'm always sort of mining. <laughs> the literature for stuff that's, you know, less than 30 pages and written like a New Yorker piece. <laughs> and is engaging, right? Students don't want to fly too high or deep into the disciplinary literature as they don't want to become sociologists or philosophers. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, uh, this is a piece of writing that is um, uh, really totally usable mm -hmm. for medical students, either in chunks or in, in, in toto. Um, I didn't know much about immunization and particularly anti-immunization until about a month and a half ago when the medical students at UNC were going through a 
big curriculum revision um, that's reorganized the landscape of, of uh, scientific knowledge according to organ system. And the first organ system is the immunological system. Uh, and uh, as director of the humanities and social science coil, um, I've been given license to have a few sort of speaking parts, but mostly um, to offer these original documents that um, help to build on hooks that are provided in the science lectures uh, and, uh, and encourage the science teachers to, um, to incorporate what I would call STS perspectives, to, to move the social. Um, uh, we, we tend to do a pretty good job talking about the social as a determinant of you know, illness experience or healthcare access or even the messy lives that doctors lead sometimes and you know, hospitals. Um, but we don't talk about how science itself, the undertakings of science, are social. And, so, and a great way to teach that is to teach controversies. And, um, to, and so, um, anyway, the, the immunization controversy loomed as something worth teaching, uh, in part because it's been fueled by some uh, bad science, some misrepresented mm -hmm. science, um, some you know, flat out fraud. But um, so it's, a, it's an interesting. Uh, so I have, if, if anybody is interested, the um, enrichment document around um, uh, in, you know, immunization, anti-immunization here that I am going to turn around and in its next iteration um, put uh, Google's book into as a, as a um, really lovely investigation of this controversy without polarizing it and making it um, uh, deeply political, which of course it can be. Um, I had a few thoughts about genre. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the it is an essay, and um, uh, Eula has some thoughts on essays uh, in, in, in the book and in um, particular in one or two of the footnotes. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, and it's got this segmented uh, uh, quality, so you could almost look at some of these segments as themselves essays. Mm -hmm. They they're little clusters of ideas that activate one another, and so you talked about the relationships between these parts as being something that she developed, nurtured, and, um, and it, it, it is very interesting. Uh, I had occasion recently to be reading more than I intended to, and you go down these rabbit holes and, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> about essays, about essay writing, and because mm -hmm. um, there's this push to make medical students write essays, and the question, you know, why and what, what's the, the vocation of the essay. Um, and, and some of the most interesting writing about essays lauds this kind of anti-systematic, um, mm -hmm. uh, this essays are, Theodore Adorno talks about the force field of the essay that activates um, these, these um, different uh, elements or nodes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I did think of these uh, segments of the essay as like nodes, right? And nodes are important to the immune system, as is maybe seems far-fetched, but yeah. there's a lovely passage where Eula talks about her father, your father, mm -hmm. um, uh, in a gesture of caring and also technical, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, handling the, you know, palpating the necks of a sick child for, um, for nodes, right? And um, so the, these things have that feel of carefully handled set of. Uh, I was reminded at a few junctures of Lewis Thomas's *Lives of the Cell*. Any of you read in that book? But it's um, in my generation. It was um, a really important collection of essays. Lewis Thomas was a physician with deep ties to immunology and um, and undertook to. Um, undo some of the illusion of our separateness by showing how we, you know, share mitochondrial, you know, um, interlopers and all, you know, all kinds of interesting things, but changing, adjusting our vision with, according to scale and um, I don't know if you're a reader of Thomas, but... Um, yeah, I, I was a huge fan. I actually came to that book through his daughter, Abigail Thomas, who uh -huh. is also a writer. Right. Um, she wrote a book I admired a lot called Safekeeping, which is also written in little segments. Um, and it's a memoir. And it's an interesting memoir in that she it moves between, in her segments, she moves uh, all around in verb tense. So sometimes she's in the past tense, sometimes in the present, sometimes even in the future tense. 
And but she also moves point of view. So sometimes she's writing in the first person, sometimes in the second person, sometimes in the third person. And there's this real kind of fluidity in this text. Um, and then my older colleague said to me, you know whose daughter she is. And then I picked up Lives of a Cell and was blown away and, and just thought it was an incredibly exciting book um, for all the reasons you just mentioned, but also formally interesting to me in that it is also written in little pieces. Yes. And, um, and I think, now that I think back, you know, I always think of other writers as giving permission kind of for, for what a writer can do. And I think I probably got some permission from Lives of the Cell to write a book that is in small sections. Um, though I didn't intend for that to happen, it, it happened as I was writing. I had this assumption that all these sections would merge and become one. And, um, and then there was a moment where I was vexed by why they didn't. and. Um, and I felt like I was kind of arguing with the book, like saying, why won't you become one? And, um, and then I realized that the form of the book is, is really intrinsic to what the book is talking about. So the, the, the book is talking about our bodies as both independent and dependent. And I found when I started trying to excerpt from this book for publications right when it came out, is no one wanted to publish excerpts from this book because these segments don't actually stand alone very well at all. They aren't very satisfying as essays when they're, when they're torn out of the whole. And so I kept having publications say, we like this, but it doesn't feel whole. It doesn't, and I was thinking, well, no, it isn't whole. It's a tiny part of this thing that is composed of, of 30. Um, but yeah, this, this tradition of the essay, um, an essay means a lot of different things. We use this word in so many different contexts. Um, and you know, we, we have academic essays and scholarly essays and argumentative essays. And, and I work in, I see myself as working in this long tradition of personal essay that goes back to um, Say Shanigan in Japan and Montaigne in France and Cicero and Seneca. Um, and you can, you can actually t trace a lineage, though not all those people were reading each other, um, in the way that the, the writing is being engaged with, and, and in part as a, as, a, as a mode of exploration. And so, you know, when I talk about my writing, I often have to reveal that I didn't know what was going to happen when I initiated the process. And, and, and that's, um, that's for me what makes it a vital, interesting document. Um, I actually cease to be interested in my books once they're done. It's, it's you know, it's the process is over. It's um, for me the exciting part is w when it's still moving and changing and asking me to think in different ways. And um, and I find that when I teach essay writing, that's the quality that is both exciting and terrifying to students of the essay. Um, Many students who are trained in academic writing want to know what they're going to say before they sit down to write. And it's really scary to sit down with an empty page and, and not know what's going to happen in that space. Um, and I've had students come to me and say, I, I wrote a draft, but it felt really bad. It felt chaotic and upsetting, and I didn't know where I was going, and I still don't quite know what I'm saying. And my response is always, yes, that's how it's supposed to feel. It doesn't necessarily feel good, but that is what this process is like. Um, and I think that this is part of what the essay has to offer us um, as a, I don't know, as a society, is a space where we see searching and exploration happen. Um, and see people maybe arrive at ideas, but not enter the work with those ideas. Um, which I do think is becoming, I don't know if it's becoming more valuable, but I think it's, it's very valuable. I, I realized this recently when I, I asked all my writing students to write um, what they thought was the one most pressing issue facing writers today. I was just curious what these senior writers would say. And I was really surprised. Um, so many of them said they expressed um, concern about 
the kind of proliferation of opinion-based writing, so stuff that feels like op-eds on blogs, and it, they were saying, we see all these venues for writing opening, and that could be exciting, except it's not what you just trained us to do. It's, it's like we see all these places where people are just having opinions and stating them, and we just spent four years learning how basically not to do that. And so their concern as seniors who are about to, to graduate is, is there actually a space for what I've just learned to do? Um, which it had never occurred to me to, um, to think of it from the student's point of view like that. But I could see when, when you're surrounded by kind of unexamined opinions all the time, how you could feel like, oh, I actually live in a, in a place that doesn't value what I do. Um, and maybe I'll circle back around to your question about the subtitle, um, yeah, because I was so interested in that idea of the, the immunological components in the 30 sections, like their own nodes or components. Um, nodes is actually a very helpful metaphor for me in thinking about the form, because you know it, these, these nodes are concentrations of things that are circulating throughout the body, but but this stuff is also moving through. So the nodes are also places where stuff that's come from other parts of the body lands and then moves on sometimes. And, um, and I do think, even though this book is in 30 com compartments, they're very fluid compartments. And, and there isn't a single idea that comes up that isn't returned to somewhere in the book. So th they're, they're in conversation with each other. Um, and on immunity, the, an inoculation was a joke at first, actually, that subtitle was a joke, because I wasn't, I didn't feel like anything funny was happening in this book, and I, I made this joke, it was just between me and me, actually, I was sitting with my document, and I gave it this subtitle, and it was for me to have some giggles, you know, while I was writing. And then I never removed it, and I sent it to my editor, and he loved the subtitle. And then I had to say, no, that's, that was actually a joke. And, um, and he said, well, think about it. Think about whether it could be. And then I did start to think about it. And, um, and I looked up the word and looked up the etymology of inoculation and saw that the broadest meaning of inoculation is to join or unite. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, this, this actually is the subtitle for this book. It's, um, th that's, you know, the underlying goal is to bring things together that have been kind of polarized and to bring bring thinking and ideas together um, and then but then I also thought more there was something that I had had major reservations about in this book um, that and my editor and I had talked about it quite a bit I was really wary of repeating fears about vaccination um, it I couldn't figure out how to write this book without doing that um, but as a new mother I had found those fears so unproductive and so actually hostile to my project that I really didn't want to, um, I didn't want to enter another new mother's space and, and inhabit it with these fears. Um, and so I, I'd really been struggling with, am I gonna do that, am I not? Is there any way not to do that in this book? And then I thought, well, if I think of it as an inoculation where you, you actually intentionally introduce the pathogen to the body but with the purpose of protecting the body against that pathogen in the future, then I thought, okay, there's a reason for me to repeat these fears in here. And the reason is to actually protect this person from succumbing to total, like unexamined runaway anxiety. Um, and so in that sense, I, I came to think, oh, actually this book could, could act like an inoculation in some ways. Yeah. It's so helpful. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. What is uh, uh, please, please ask a follow-up. Um, well, I, I wanted to, to say one thing, I guess, about um, uh, aims. That, that this, there was one framework that I found really helpful. It might be helpful to you if you're tuned in to some of this literature, but I wound up over the last couple of three years um, for various reasons, mostly having smart graduate students demand it of me. Um, having to tunnel into the literature on biopolitics. Um, it's a term that signifies for, anyway. And, um, I, and I had, 
I, when I had had to, you know, kind of compose thoughts around this intervention for the medical students, I thought of the, you know, the, um, the, the immunization, anti-immunization controversy as a kind of tension between biopolitical regime, which is, originates with the state and the state's power and duty to protect and enhance the life of a population. Um, and what we're now calling biosocial formations, which um, arise at the level of us, you know, lowly subjects, right, who discover amongst one another that we have some biological um, element in common, right? We share a disease, we have some trait, we, you know, we share a, an allele. But these forms of biosociality, um, as Mark, is a term that's been given to forms of affinity that we discover, and so the groups that form without any authorization from the government, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so different authors have taken this up and called it bio citizenship, bio um, uh, therapeutic citizenship. Um, uh, Saiba mentioned, you know, the, the citizen and, and how the notion of being a healthy citizen is changing. Anyway, I um, so. Uh, I'd always associated the vaccination resistance as a sort of biosocial thing. This is us families with autistic kids, right, banding together saying, you know, your vaccines caused it, government, right, and, and, and a biopolitical regime, um, you know, and what, what, I think, what, what, I, what I think is fair to say about your project is that you're taking the question of immunization um, and governmental, pro without disavowing the governmental origins or the, the who's archived at those 70,000 kids, you know, who, yeah. um, uh, uh, with chickenpox, right, mm -hmm. that um, are registered in. But um, returning it to the question of, of biosociality, right, um, we, um, if we're going to embrace immunization, um, it's not because we're going to all of a sudden turn around and believe the government. We're going to have to discover these forms of affinity and commonality one amongst another, and so it's the first of which is fear, right, mm -hmm. and and, um, and this um, desire of the mother to protect her children. This is a feminist book, and it's a really interestingly feminist book. Um, and uh, anyway, I, I just, uh, for me, it was really helpful to think of the book as ultimately a, a way of trying to rearticulate an account of, of you know, reasons to um, be um, warmer toward immunization. By entering into the the, the grounds of, of social, you know, affinity that we have and feel with mothers who are bio, mm -hmm. uh, with who are um, immunization immunization hesitant. Yeah, yeah, yeah vaccination hesitant. Yeah. Um, or or those who are there. anyway. So uh, let's see. I did. Um, I like that you said I was feminist. I just want to say that I appreciate that. And and for me, like. Vaccines is like the ostensible subject, right? It's the entryway, but when I really stand back from the book and think, what was I writing about? I think I did have a vision of like feminist citizenship is like how I would describe what I was trying to talk about, like a, a citizenship informed by feminist values. Yeah, great. And I think that really comes out at the end of your book when you use like the metaphor of gardening. Yeah. And thinking instead of kind of paternalistic care, but thinking about care, maybe maternalistic yeah. care and what that kind of opens up um, yeah. that's different from like this biomedical sort of paternalistic idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and this term paternalism has really tied a lot of, has tied the government and it's tied the medical establishment to a form of parenting that actually, I don't think a lot of fathers practice anymore in contemporary landscape. You know, we we have, as a society, moved away from a certain model of fatherhood, um, but we still use that model of fatherhood as a metaphor for the state and the medical establishment. When I think that using the word maternalism is is helpful because even though it sometimes means other things, and I had to navigate that in the notes, but um, in the, it, it, I think it refreshes the metaphor and reminds us that, oh, there's something else going on here in addition to you know, the power differential and the control and subjugation. There's also care and, um, and a, a desire to protect and 
um, and improve the lives of citizens that are happening within the medical establishment and in the government. And, and that's actually why we have both of those entities, right? To, is, is because we need systems to provide care and, and in, in, in a sense, society needs parents and, um, and it's, it's right for us to be suspicious of power when it's not used well, but I also think that we can't um, throw out the benefits of these systems with their drawbacks, that we have to find some way um, to be both like responsibly skeptical and, and trusting so that we can be well parented. Um, but it, that, it, to me, that, that paternalism conversation is still very tricky. Um, and I was talking to uh, the novelist, Chris Adrian, um, who, who writes, he, he's done some work in the, um, there's a narrative medicine program at Columbia, and he's done some work there, but he also writes crazy novels where you're, like, um, Walt Whitman is traveling in a time machine and uh, like through different war zones and it's it's crazy awesome fiction that he writes um, and quite beautiful and he's also a pediatric oncologist and um, and we brought him to Northwestern to talk and he he and I had an exchange about paternalism where he said you know he's he's probably about my age and he said, you know, in my generation of medical students were taught that the worst thing you can do is be paternalistic. You know, do anything, do anything you have to do to avoid being paternalistic. And he said, now that I've been in practice for a while, I, I find myself kind of troubled with, by that sometimes. I'm thinking, you know, are, are there occasions where actually I, I should do something that could be interpreted or seen as paternalism? And, and he was really, you know, in our, the conversation, neither he nor I had an answer to that, and, and I still don't have an answer to it, but I think that it's, the thing that I do feel a little more certain about is that we can't just, um, I think it's a mistake to say all forms of paternalism are wrong and dangerous. Um, when I, I think there's situations where we, we need that kind of oversight. Well, I think we could sit here between the three of you and talk for hours. We could talk for a long time. <laughs> I would like to throw it open to our audience here for some questions, if you have any. Sure. Um, so, first off, I'm just really excited to be here. I haven't read your book yet, but I'm so excited to read it now. Um, I'm a senior public policy major and I'm pre-med. I'm doing my um, honors thesis on distrust of government and vaccine refusal. Oh, wow. Um, so this is like, <laughs> this is it. This is exactly right up my alley. Um, and I just really feel like um, I've gained so much language to talk about this um, because part of my issue is coming from a very kind of public health um, scientific standpoint is it's very numbers, it's very quantitative. And um, I did a quantitative um, study on if parents who distrust the government and parents who distrust healthcare providers are more likely not to vaccinate and do a number of other parental health and safety decisions. Um, and most of my hypotheses were true and that they do tend not to vaccinate more um, among other things. But I think one of the things that has been really hard for me is um, yeah, just trying to communicate all of this because in the beginning of this, I, I started very similarly to you where I was like, people who don't vaccinate are ignorant. Mm -hmm. End of story. I, you know, it ends the conversation when you say that. Um, and as I've done my research, it's really just been um, this crazy journey of like finding out that there are very legitimate fears. There are very, it's a very emotional process. It's a time of a child's life when, and of a parent's life that is, is very sensitive to a lot of different external um, things. And I think kind of going back to why, um, you know, why do our concerns um, about medicine kind of coalesce in, about vaccines as opposed to other pharmaceuticals, I think part of it is that um, it's one of the most visibly regulated um, medical decisions. While there are lots of medical decisions that are regulated, it's a lot of like undercover stuff through in insurance companies. You don't realize, oh, you're only allowed to get this once a year and it's covered by insurance. Well, that's a decision that public policymakers made 
but it's not as visible as um, as you know these are the vaccines your kid needs to get before you go to public school mm -hmm. um, and kind of that that being very emotional for people um, I guess I started out just reading blogs um, of anti-vaccinators um, who tended to be either um, white women who are extremely educated and liberal and usually wealthy, mm -hmm. um, or also kind of a religious subsect um, that was more um, like homeschool, mm -hmm. um, usually more conservative. So I was really interested about like the, is there any difference, you know, any similarities between those two? Um, but yeah, I just, you know, I just wanted to comment that I really um, appreciated the language um, that I feel like I'll be able to use and also that now I can point um, people to another resource after they I talk about my thesis because I think there's just, it's so complex, you know, I want to go back and tell the, the person that I started as in this project and be like, are you incapable of complexity? <laughs> <laughs> this is just, you know, saying that people are ignorant, end of story, um, you know, and that I'm going to be a doctor and anyone who, um, you know, I do, I do want to be an OBGYN and I'm, my original stance was anybody who chooses not to vaccinate, I can't even, don't walk in my door. Um, but I just feel like this is really, um, you know, been been such an interesting journey and I think talking about helpful metaphors and like just even seeing like the overlay of different um, you know using English as a way mm -hmm. to, to connect with medicine is just so important um, and and hard to explain to people because it's like okay yeah like your pet project of like you like to write papers and you also like medicine but um, they're, they're so the language and um, you use even as a physician to a, a patient to communicate um, I think is is essential, like you were talking about the, the different metaphors that the immunologists use. And um, anyway, yeah. So that was just comment, but thank no, you so much. Yeah, I'm really <laughs> excited for your project. Yeah, and I'm glad that people are doing work like what you're doing. And you know, there's there's something that I want someone to do. Again, I don't think I'm the right person for it, but I got a really good, hard critique of this book right before it was finished. And um, it came from uh, the essayist Maggie Nelson, who I, I admire, and she has a, a wonderful book that's going to be coming out this spring called The Argonauts. Um, and she read a draft of this for me not too long before I had to hand in the whole book. Um, and she gave me lots of useful advice that I actually was able to incorporate, but her biggest critique was something that was so big that I would have had to either rewrite the book or rewrite a new book in order to tackle it. But her big critique was she said, you know, you, you really put a lot of responsibility on the individual in, in, in your kind of assessment of the situation. And she said, but what I keep thinking about in this book is, what's going wrong on the governmental level that this many people don't feel safe? And um, this many people don't feel that they can trust um, pharmaceutical companies or doctors or politicians and um, and she said there there's really a, a necessary and meaningful examination of of the structure of our government to be made in this area to figure out what needs to change so that people feel safe and that struck me as a as a great critique and as something that yeah that's something that somebody needs to look at and um, and for a while, I felt really despondent, like, oh, I have to turn in this book in three weeks, and I can never tackle that. But, um, but then Maggie released me, and she said, oh, you, you apply what you learn from this to the next project, um, which I think is right. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, I think, so much interesting work to happen around this. So the schedule says that we end at 1.15, but uh, I think that we're happy to stay for a little while. Yeah, longer. but no one should feel like a prisoner. But yeah. you should stay. <laughs> <laughs> if you need to go, if you need to go, please go. It's um, OK. But are, are there any other questions? It's okay. Bailey. It's not so much a question as a comment as well. Um, and I was encouraged by your comment, because I'm kind of coming from the other end of the spectrum. I will never be a doctor. In fact, I do um, Renaissance and early modern literature. So I appreciated the medieval shout out last night. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I came to the talk last night thinking you know, this is going to be worthwhile because I had read your piece, Relations, in Duncan's class. And I thought, this is a brilliant writer who I would love to hear speak. But I'm not a doctor, and this isn't really going to intersect my life at all. 
and I was totally blown away by how much it had to bear on my own work, mm -hmm. which is mostly about forgiveness in Shakespeare's later plays. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to share kind of just a meditation that I had um, mm -hmm. on a piece that's not from one of the romances, but um, just on this idea of of digesting and of um, separating yourself from other people. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this great moment in the Comedy of Errors, which is overall a play about oneness, right? Of twins that have been separated being reunited and a married couple who've been separated finding each other again. Um, there's a wife who thinks their husband's cheating on her. Actually, she knows. She sees him leaving the brothel and she's like, okay. <laughs> she kind of catches him by the collar and she says, if we two be one and you play false, mm -hmm. I do digest the poison of your flesh being strumpeted by your contagion. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting line. And I was thinking about it last night when we were talking about these metaphors because I was like, this is so relevant to what I do because I think, I think my takeaway was that the vaccine is like the ultimate human fantasy. It's this shield that, that keeps us safe from evil in all its forms, you know, from disease and from sin and from ideological corruption. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to you for that sort of traction that it had with my work. Um, I don't know if there was a question in there, but... Did you say that line again? It was so amazing. <laughs> she says, if we two be one, referring to Genesis 2, the idea of um, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, becoming one flesh, and you play false, meaning you're cheating on me. Um, I do digest the poison of your flesh, being strumpeted by your uh, contagion. And strumpet's just a, an old word for a whore, um, mm -hmm. but specifically for an adulterous wife. Mm -hmm. So what she's saying is that your sin, your decision to be unfaithful to me, is making me sinful. Mm -hmm. Your evil is entering my body, because actually our bodies mm -hmm. are one. Mm -hmm. That's like that. really amazing. Um, this just reminds me, and I, I don't want to be the only one of the three of us who responds, um, but uh, a medievalist I work with uh, just gave me a paper that she wrote. Her, her name is Barbara Newman, and she wrote a paper about organ tran contemporary organ transplants, but um, was under looking at contemporary organ transplants informed by medievalist theology. And, um, and there apparently was a, a trope in medieval literature that was about giving someone else your heart. Like, but it was, it, it was a metaphor, but it was rendered very literally, like, you know, you, you would dig your hands into your flesh, take out your heart, and give it to someone else. And, um, and some nuns even had, you know, the, the moment in which they felt called to Jesus, they described as Jesus actually taking their heart physically out of their body, and that's when they knew that they were joined to the church forever. Mm -hmm. And, um, and she, she carries this medieval thinking into contemporary debates around organ transplant and in what the real relationship is between the donor and the recipient and um, and whether there's something more than an organ being shared there and it's actually what she was doing was too complex I'm realizing now for me to make a synopsis of but it's a really another fascinating meeting place between contemporary medicine and um, medieval literature. Other questions? Yes. So, um, what I really like is the the panel itself. I mean, I've mm. only read a little bit of your book, so I'm looking forward to finishing it. But one of the things that strikes me coming from this forum for scholars and publics is how nicely this cross-section of people at this panel kind of comes together. So Saiba is a medical anthropologist who's teaching in the Thompson Writing Program here at Duke, and so is probably, I guess, having to you know, think about how you use different genres uh, to teach the issues that, that you want students to learn, and Barry has done such a great job of talking about how his own teaching and, and, and work as, a, as a, someone who teaches uh, aspiring doctors has driven him to look at essays. Mm -hmm. And then I'm curious for you, and you've just been talking about medievalists and how you're crossing all these scholarly boundaries, so I'd just like to hear that talked about more explicitly, maybe among the three of you, about how you do work across these, these boundaries, and in particular for you, I know you, you talked about research, um, you know, well, is, is, and I think about the essay as in really nice form that 
is not so threatening maybe to the scholarly community. I mean, because I, you know, Jared Diamond is, is almost uniformly reviled now by anthropologists mm -hmm. because he's tried to do these big tomes that, that answer all the questions. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it seems that you've taken this on in a much more modest, humble way. And um, so that's an observation, but also a question about about how you perceive yourself being understood by the scholars on whom, whose work you're drawing and, yeah. and how you navigate that world and then from the two of you, how your perception of that too. Yeah, that's a really interesting question and you know, at, in my institution, writers are kind of peripheral um, and and at first that was upsetting to me, like we, we, we don't get tenured at Northwestern and there's, you, there's lots of other ways in which we're peripheral to the institution. But after a while I started actually valuing that situation where I'm, I'm kind of this peripheral entity on the institution. And I'm, I, an essayist is a generalist, you know, and, and there are people who choose not to be, but in the, the kind of um, thread of essay that I work in, um, most of the people who I think back on as, um, you know, is my lineage, you know, like Montaigne and writers like this, were, were general, generalists, and they were, um, they were making encounters with, with people who held knowledge and drawing it from many different spheres of knowledge. And, and I do very much see that as part of my job, uh, is to, to be a generalist in conversation with experts and with people who have areas of specialization. And um, not just to bring those you know, I, I do think that one of the things I can do as an essayist is bring a disciplines into conversation that aren't always in conversation and, and put them in the same, on the same page just so they interact. But I also think, and this is one of my values in terms of how I use language, um, there's a lot of specialized language in academia and um, sometimes I feel like in tremendously exciting ideas are locked inside a language that is not incredibly accessible to the, the public at large. So I actually do see part of my role as an essayist is gleaning and understanding concepts and ideas from within academia and then and bringing them into a, a form that is accessible and you know going back to Montaigne again who's you know thought of as the, the you know the grandfather of the essay or something he chose to write in the vernacular of his time, in, in vernacular French, when everyone else who was a serious writer was writing in Latin. And, um, and it was an it, it was a unusual move for him to make. Um, but I think that that is part of what the essay is about, is speaking the vernacular of the time. Um, and, and so that you can engage with you know, a, a, a broad public. Um, but I'm, I'm interested, I, I, I'm interested in hearing both of your thoughts on interdisciplinarity because both of you are also interdisciplinary as well. Um, I guess for me, I, I do use a lot of, um, of nonfiction in my teaching. Um, we just finished reading um, Anne Fadim and oh, that's very yeah. catchy with you. And I feel like this kind of work, and I don't know if I can generalize about essays in general, but I do feel like this kind of lyrical narrative, nonfiction, it's really helpful in kind of mapping things out um, in a way that I feel like, yeah, coming from our disciplines and anthropology in particular, we're really locked in, as you were saying. Um, but for example, I could imagine students making a kind of concept map of this book, right? And looking at how one thing like immunity actually connects with so many other things that we don't even think about. And that's something that really struck me mm -hmm. while reading this book was just how wide ranging it is. I mean, I think similarly with, you know, something like The Spirit Catches You, you can kind of map out what does biomedicine do well and what does it sort of obscure? What do other kinds of healing mm -hmm. do well? And what do they obscure? And I feel like having that out for students is just an incredibly productive and not, you know, me just telling them that that's how it is um, way of getting it. So I find them, you know, I find it incredibly useful. And 
in my own class, I was also just really struck by, um, I'm having my students write like illness narratives, so they're interviewing a family member or someone close to them who suffered a life-threatening illness, and then um, they're gonna write a paper about it. And we went around the room, and I was so struck by how almost all of them had had, you know, in their immediate family, had had someone suffer like a serious kind of life-threatening illness, like more than half the class, their mothers had had breast cancer at some point in their lives. Um, and to me that was just kind of a wake-up call about how I think like these books have, you know, there's so much kind of connective tissue that I feel like we can draw on. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just think they're incredibly productive to think with. Yeah. Um, I could say something about straddling disciplines, but I'm actually still interested in the essay, and um, in, even in some tensions between the essay and um, narrative. Um, you know, Jared Diamond, great case in point, right? We got this master narrative, um, uh, mansplaining, <laughs> invoke one of the yes jacket comments, right? <laughs> and uh, and. And this essay genre, which can, can do lots of things, but um, in Eula's hands, does uh, it conducts a conversation like Montaigne had with, you know, the friends on his library shelf. Um, it's and a conversation can go on forever, right? Uh, Duncan's already warned us about this. <laughs> it's, it's in principle open ended, right? The Socratic dialogue, you know, winds down, but it, it doesn't end necessarily. Whereas a narrative aspires to closure, coherence has a telos, right? And so I, um, I think one of the, the beautiful things about this book is that in the, in the mode of an inoculation, it provokes us to ask questions, respond, fill in spaces. There are a lot of spaces in the book. Um, gaps between these nodes where you're provoked to think, you know, what's that doing there? 